My dad actually brought a human brain into my class. Real brain? A real brain. Wow. I will be sharing some research to take a small piece of a human brain, every single cell and every single connection between cells, which has never been done before. Which is you'll have a smaller set of suppliers for the large models. There's possibilities that as we look to what can scale, we may not be using transformers per Confidential. <laughs> it's still confidential right now. Uh, you'll be the first to know in Korea. Uh, <laughs> Wow. Hi, nice to meet you. Kat and Lizzie? Yes. Uh, yes. Can you say hi to Joe Coding subscribers and please introduce yourself? Hi, Joe Coding subscribers. <laughs> I am Catherine Chow. I am the head of product in UX for Google Research. And I was here last year speaking yeah. with you. Hello, Joe Coding subscribers. I'm Lizzie Dorfman. I am the product lead for science AI in Google Research. And I'm so happy to be here with you all. Thank you. Uh, what drew you to AI research and science? So I have been doing Google Research for mm. the last decade. And what drew me was a desire to learn more deeply mm. about the technology and the impact that the technology was having in society. And research affords this opportunity to be able to go quite deep mm. and really think through all the implications of what the technology's role should be in society. And then the AI side of it was actually started when I started working in health and life sciences. Mm. I saw immense potential for AI back then, and I wanted to actually see the opportunity to take the wealth of knowledge and information that is there in the world around healthcare and life sciences and be able to synthesize that and harness it for empowering ourselves as users and also help the clinicians and our communities with that knowledge. So that's how I got into AI. Oh, and Lizzie, what drew you to AI research and science? Yeah, my interest started when I was very young. Mm. I grew up with my parents are both doctors and my dad actually brought a human brain into my class when I was in fifth grade. Real brain? A real brain, wow. a teaching specimen from the hospital. Oh. We'll never forget, he told me, this is a brain and it is the most incredible organ and we don't know how it works. We don't know why it's able to do what it does. And that inspired in me a lifelong interest in trying to grow our knowledge of biology and the world. And so research and science and AI and technology combine that all together. Oh, so interesting. Oh, real brain. Real brain. Wow. <laughs> Since our last interview, Palm 2, in July last year, what major changes have you observed in the AI world? Yes. It's a good question. Mm. So much has changed yeah. since last time we saw each other. So fast. Yeah. Very fast. This <laughs> is one of the fastest moving movements in technology that mm. I've seen. We have seen generative AI go from research to just regular developer communities. And the prompt engineering work is an industry in and of mm. itself at this point. You have this problem with hallucination that has mm. been largely starting to be addressed by RAG and these ability to ground the content. So it's really moving towards what do we do when we have to synthesize information into knowledge. And that is largely asking the question of what is fact and what is truth. So that's a whole different space to try and tackle. You also have this movement towards real world use cases. So this is what are we doing so that this can actually work in the hands of everyday users. That means that it needs to be able to be performant and cost effective. So there's a lot of research that needs to go into actually making these models much more accessible and more prolific. So lots and lots has, have changed, in, yeah. I think, in the space, yeah. So fast. <laughs> Very fast. There have been growing concerns about AI bubble in the industry. And as mentioned by David Kahn from Sequoia Capital in his AI's $600 question. Have you read about that? Oh, yeah. What's your perspective on these concerns on the potential AI bubble? Do you think this is affecting your research at Google? Well, I think that the AI bubble, we've had a tech bubble before. Mm. I do think that there has been a lot of money poured into the space for building mm. large language models. Because of the competition, this has been, uh, the market is being driven down to zero cost and mm. that makes it difficult. So I do think that we're seeing the that bubble burst mm. a little bit. And I imagine that if we speak again a year mm. from now, that that would be kind of coming to fruition. That said, for Google Research, 
research, we really do look ahead and we're quite excited about what comes next because a lot of what we're seeing is, and you see this even with the founders of these different startups moving towards the real world practical applications, you actually are starting to apply the technology. And in that space, there's a lot of research to be done. I mentioned earlier the work that needs to be done to make sure that these models are much more efficient, both from a compute energy data efficiency perspective. There's also work to be done to be able to apply it to, for Google, a lot of our products at Google would benefit tremendously from having the generative AI capabilities and the agentic capabilities. So bring that role class set of capabilities to our products. And then also when you think about using these models in practice, you have practical applications and needs like privacy, trust and safety, ethical concerns. All of these things can actually be built in now at this point. Um, and that's part of the research that we do. So there's a lot to actually be done. I will provide a, a short response that's mm -hmm. specific to science. Our science research is not focused on revenue. But one thing that I think is interesting about science is if you make a claim about how useful AI is, unless you have very impressive evidence to support that claim, no one will believe you. And in fact, at Google, we have um, applied various types of AI technologies, vision technologies, transformer technologies to different scientific problems and faced skepticism and disbelief in the very beginning that it would work at all. And in fact, it is very gratifying when you convince the larger ecosystem through evidence that something is useful towards a scientific problem. So it takes a slightly different path in science compared to some of the business and product considerations. As a head of product and UX for Google Research, how do you envision shaping the future of AI products, including the context of AI applications and Gemini? I think that having been at Google for 20 years, mm -hmm. one of the first things we always do in research is applying it to our products. Mm -hmm. So we have many products that serve billions of users. So that is always part of our core efforts with our research work. And these agentic capabilities are extremely empowering for the users if we apply it to the products in the right way. So that's one. But I also see a real opportunity in two other ways for Gemini and the generative AI role. One is really dealing with places that are fraught with complications, areas that typically have been hard for users to actually be able to work with, things like finance or legal. These are very complicated spaces, but they don't need to be so complicated. And I think generative AI and the agentic capabilities will help transform that role to be a lot more accessible and democratic in those spaces. The other is whenever you have a technological wave, you have the opportunity to address social inequities. And so this is similarly, I think, going to unlock access to certain areas that have been in dire need of innovation. Places that I'm familiar with is health and education, but there's also things that we are doing right now looking into these spaces for helping look after the planet and understanding the science is much better. As a product lead for science AI at Google Research, what is your ultimate goal? Our ultimate goal in science AI research, well, there's two. One is we want to be contributing towards breakthroughs for the biggest grand challenge scientific problems. That's number one. Number two, we want to accelerate the rate of scientific progress and scientific discovery. Can you give us example about the first, the biggest problem? So a good example, and actually for this event that brings me to Seoul, I'll be sharing some work in neuroscience. Mm. So I told you, the brain. <laughs> My dad brought a brain oh, in. Yeah. I will be sharing some research that we did with Harvard University to take a small piece of a human brain and to make a cellular level map of that brain. Every single cell and every single connection between cells, which has never been done before. That's an example of and the understanding more about how the brain works is a huge scientific grand challenge. It is our identity. It is our sensory experiences. It is also the disorders like Alzheimer's that we need to understand and to be able to cure. So that's a type of scientific grand challenge. But we also make AI methods and data sets that we open source, that we make available to external scientists to use in their own research. And so that's the type of tool that we might think of making available to accelerate the rate of scientific discovery. So cool, yeah.
I think so too. <laughs> yeah. How do you foster collaboration between research teams, product development, and UX design to ensure that research potential for social impact is maximized? Yes, thank you for that question. The challenge with research is always to be able to bring people and ideas together. It's easy in research to go quite deep. So we focus on cross-pollination. We have taken a page out of the Aristotle School. They used to have the Lyceum. This is a forum for public discourse. It's within our own communities, but it is open. And we have things that are of the shape of a fireside chat like this. But also we call them campfires. Afterwards, people can then come together around that particular discussion that we had and be able to follow up on it with world-class experts that we have at Google Research. And so that's one way that we do the cross-pollination. We also have what we call these innovation pods. They're made out of virtual teams. When we say virtual, it means that you can come from any team and you can actually work across different functions. So it could be for UX product or a research scientist, and you can come together because you share an objective or a mission. It could be a grand challenge, for example, and that would bring all of the people together. So we have a number of these different approaches that we take. Next question can be a little sensitive question. Recently, there is some buzz around XAI's Croc 2 for its relatively uncensored AI capabilities. Have you ever saw the Croc 2's image? Yes, yes. Very uncensored. In contrast, Google seems to taking more cautious approach. What's your take on this? Is Google being too conservative or XAI is pushing the boundaries of responsible AI use? Some users have expressed that Google AI feels restrictive compared to alternatives. Are there plans to release or potentially relax some of these limitations? Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Well, so I do think of generative AI having created a greenfield marketplace mm -hmm. because it's new. Some mm -hmm. of the things that we're seeing that we're capable of creating products and businesses around didn't exist before. And so whenever that happens, you will see technology go in different directions to meet the market needs. Mm -hmm. So in the case of historically, you have, for example, even with the innovation of transportation and vehicles like mm -hmm. cars, we'd have still products that are targeted towards free use and the public generally. And you have things that will give you greater agency, like the commodity cars, but you also have luxury cars. Mm -hmm. So what I mean to say is that in the software space, you have something similar happening. In the social app space, we saw it with, there's some examples out there that are targeting free speech. There's things that are out there that are targeting content creators like yourself mm -hmm. to make it as easy as possible for you to have the velocity and engagement with your viewers. Then you have ones that are social apps that are intended for enterprise uses. So when I think about the generative AI models, we have a similar thing happening. There's always these trade-offs that happen. If you target a model towards very unregulated spaces, you will also get, in addition to something that I think is very needed, like free speech, I think you end up also with a lot of potential for misinformation and fraud. And so I think that you also want curated uh, systems that are actually able to take into, if not the provenance and the attribution of where some of this content comes from, you want to actually have somebody accountable for what is being produced. And so you may have this whole spectrum. And so from my perspective, it's not a limitation so much as a market segmentation that you see happening right now. What do you see as coming up in the next generation of technical infrastructure? I think that being at the center of seeing how our large language models, we needed a lot of compute to build those models. We spent a lot of time focusing on how to keep our machines busy. We are able to look ahead and we need to think about what kind of technical infrastructure will allow for developers to have high velocity. So one of the things that has restricted the speed of development is just the number of developers that can engage and actually quickly turn the capabilities into applications that are useful. So that is, I think, a lot more technical infrastructure will be built there. I also see that there may be a shift towards the traditional supplier model of a 60-30-10, where you see that you will actually be similar to like the spaces of mobile mm -hmm. or CPUs, which is you'll have a smaller set of suppliers mm -hmm. for the large models. So that, I think, will affect how architecture is developed. And in that space, you'll have optimizations more towards what I would call re 
configurable systems that actually would allow optimization across the full stack from the hardware to the software to developer level. And I also think there's possibilities that as we look to what can scale, we may not be using transformers per se as the reigning architecture because it has its limitations in how it can scale from a cost efficiency perspective. So I think these are some of the fundamental changes that we will see coming up. What are some recent exciting breakthroughs or practical application in your research? So my background is in genetics. That's what I studied for my PhD. And so Google has been doing work to develop open source methods to support genomics and genetics data for almost 10 years. The most studied organism on the planet is humans. But there's lots and lots of other organisms on the planet that are also important. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is that the methods that we have been part of developing are increasingly being used to sequence endangered species and other organisms, other animals and plants to catalog more of life on planet Earth. And it's really exciting to see our technology used for that application. Do you heard about Sakana AI recently? Yes. Oh, that was so amazing. <laughs> and uh, Sakana AI recently announced a system called the AI scientist, which aims to automate the process scientific discovery uh, using AI. What do you think about this idea of automating research? Do you believe this is something that can actually work in real world or it's just a far-fetched idea? And on that note, is Google is working similar projects or exploring this area of AI-driven scientific discoveries? I believe that generative AI and large language models are in the process of changing how we do science. And I see two immediate opportunities to use these technologies. One is in helping to quickly understand all of the existing knowledge in the world. How do you read 10,000 papers at once and carry that forward into formulating or evaluating new hypotheses? The second major opportunity that I see is there's lots and lots and lots of tools that we use in science, but it takes a lot of time to learn how to use them, to learn how to code. And I think there's a lot of evidence that large language models and agentic experiences, mm -hmm. if you understand what you are trying to do, they may be able to dramatically accelerate mm -hmm. your ability to do that work. However, what is really important when we're exploring whether something like language models can accelerate science, we need to be able to evaluate that. It needs to be able to be tested and we need quantifiable metrics that we can compute. It's hard to look at a paper that a language model generated and say, is this good or is this not good? So we and many others are in the process of actually developing better benchmarks so that we can know how well we're doing. And I think that will, in general, accelerate science, but it will really help us to understand the limits that generative AI can, can be brought to bear to accelerate scientific discovery. I think for Sakana AI, yeah. I like that they have chosen a specific mm -hmm. use case that they're going after. And as a result, I think I understand that they are exploring and experimenting with smaller models inspired by, you know, Know, biologically efficient evolution. So this smaller model approach, we talk about some of this as well in terms of, we refer to it as model grafting. And this is in some of our papers around Medgemni M, where we actually look at either having additional models that are grafted on to be able to give the depth to be able to explore the space scientifically, in this case in healthcare. But we also do it, you can think of it as maybe even the future, these anchor models with augmenting models that are domain specific specific to be able to accelerate the space. So I think that picking the use case, this is actually something that we're seeing a good advancement on the modeling side. But coming back to your question about yeah. whether discovery is actually scientific discovery mm -hmm. and research can be replaced with AI, I do think that it depends on what the definition of scientific discovery is. Mm -hmm. There is part of discovery, which is about wading through lots of mm -hmm. literature and being able to distinguish the signal from the noise, being able to really read 
read through and parse different jargon and language. I think generative AI is going to be able to help eliminate and reduce all that friction. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is part of the acceleration. I think that's a good thing. I do think that why we do science, well, we do science to understand the world better and to be able to innovate. And I think on those two fronts, it's very much necessary for humans to not take themselves out of the loop for understanding. I think we need to be really a part of it for us to understand the world. And there's a reason why there's complexity there that you don't want to just um, ignore and not understand. It's reflecting reality. Physics and all these com complex spaces that we have is complex because that's the reality. And so for us to be really in touch with that, I think that part will always be with humans right. and people to be able to, to be a part of that. So. so you asked Kat what's changed in the last year as one of your first questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A huge amount has changed in the last year for AI for science. If you went back in time one year, people were just understanding what this technology was and had a lot of confusion and skepticism about whether it could be useful yeah. for them. Part of my job that is really fun is actually talking to world experts in lots of scientific mm -hmm. fields. And increasingly, they're very excited. But the question is less, how can we automate scientific discovery? And it's, how can this help me? How can this uh, make me more efficient? How can this help me teach more people? How can this help me do things that would have been harder before? And they have increasingly very concrete ideas, which is really nice to see. How is your team defining impact in this space? So we, for much of science outside of Google, you publish. There's a term publish or perish, which is true if you work at a university. We don't focus on publication rate as we are aware of it, <laughs> but we really think about which scientific breakthroughs did we objectively make meaningful contribution to? And were we able to measurably accelerate some type of scientific field and change its trajectory through our technologies? So it really ties very, very closely to that North Star. I just think about publishing very practical goal. Yeah. We don't compete oh. with scientists and yeah. scientists at universities have to publish. That is how their careers advance. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for us at Google to be mindful of that. And we really extensively collaborate and try to develop sort of um, tools, as I mentioned, that are really useful for the practice of science. How does the science team at Google balance its research between purely scientific pursuits and potential application in Google product? That's a really good question. So the answer to that question is we focus on science. And we do that because if you add any other objectives that are product related, you very quickly start to not be focused on doing science anymore. You're focused on building the products. However, we have learned over lots of projects in lots of years that if you pick a specific specific, well-defined, and hard science problem, on your journey towards making progress on that science problem, you encounter and then have to overcome lots of incremental problems that are very general. So as an example of that, we have about a decade of investment in neuroscience. And we actually developed open source infrastructure called TensorStore that you use to store neuroscience data that can be very, very large. It turns out that open source neuroscience software actually addresses a critical challenge when you are trying to train large language models, where you need to efficiently read and write model parameters during distributed training. And so neuroscience software that we made to do scientific research is actually valuable to Google's products in a way that we couldn't 100% envision in advance, but we keep our eyes open to ways in which our scientific work, in addition to advancing scientific discovery, can also be helpful for Google's products. How does Google Research see their position within the scientific ecosystem? I would describe our how we perceive our position as contributors, collaborators, and enablers. Almost all of our work is deeply, deeply collaborative. And when you're thinking about grand challenge types of problems, those by definition are so large that they require collaboration across groups, across sectors. There's a project that we worked on recently that had 60 institutions involved. Uh, so we're very much working hand in hand with the external scientific ecosystem. 
And what is the long-term vision for science at Google? Oh my gosh. I truthfully hope that we continue to do what we're doing, which is understanding the biggest, most pressing problems, understanding Google's unique opportunities to contribute, and really thinking about how do we co-create the tools for the next generation of scientists and accelerate scientific discovery. I think I have the best job on the planet. Oh, <laughs> he has a very good job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lizzie, tomorrow during research at, you'll be talking about uh, Connectomics yes. work. And can you give us some quick summary or preview? Earlier this year, we worked in partnership with Harvard University and published in Science Magazine a data set that took a small piece of a human brain and uh, sliced it. It was about smaller than a grain of rice, very small, sliced it into five thousand slices, imaged it under an electron microscope, and then reconstructed that piece so that you could see every single cell and every single connection. It was 200 million images on that microscope, a year almost of microscope time. And the data set are public, and I'm going to be talking about how we did that, but also sharing some of the really interesting findings from that work. I want to hear the details. It's so interesting. What are you looking forward to most uh, for this year's research at event in Korea? I wasn't able to join you last year in person, but I I believe there's, it's invaluable to be able to engage people directly. So we're excited to be meeting the partners, the researchers, the developers, the people who are here on the ground as part of the research community. So that's a key reason why we're here and you're included in that. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> what specific goals does Google hope to achieve by hosting the research at, uh, event in Korea? And how does it aim to foster collaboration with the local research community? Especially especially on AI. I am so thrilled that we run these for researchers by researchers events and they give us a chance to meet in person with local communities from around the world. And this is how we can build relationships and it's how we can understand and get new ideas for new projects to work on together. The world is both big and small, so we can communicate digitally, which is great, but there's nothing like having the chance to meet people in person. And I love that we can come to visit people where they are. Does Google Research have any specific programs or initiative in place to support and neuter the next generation of AI researchers and talent in Korea, particularly through events like Research Ed? Yeah. So we're hosting these events, which is great, and it's a chance to meet people. There's a couple of other things that, that come to mind. One of them is that, and this is particularly true for our science teams, we every year have multiple calls for proposals where Google offers funding for researchers who are working in different applications of AI. We also work with lots of students, having them come work with us for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. And it's really fantastic to have people who are in their training come inside of a company, a research division at a company, and learn. And the last thing that I'll say is that this is more of an opportunity, but the developer community in particular for science is one that I'm very excited about. We have increasingly tools, and I mentioned we're investing into better benchmarks, and the, I think the combination of those means that maybe more developer communities who don't necessarily have deep scientific expertise in the problem can still contribute towards new solutions. So I'm hopeful that we will soon have more Google developer group communities communities that are more science focused, hopefully one in Korea. Are there any unique opportunities for Google research in Korea context? Well, I think that we are looking to establish that as part of why we're here. We have been working on specific partnerships that allow for researchers to co-collaborate. We have learned that there is a startup forum as well. So I think there's a set of unique things that Korea as a nation is embracing AI. And I think that they're trying to enable much more and foster a lot more collaborations with the developers, whether they're in startups or whether they're in universities. And so we as Google are playing a role in, in actually working out many of these different programs. And so I think some of these are being discussed at the Research At event mm. tomorrow. I'm very uh, excited about the ideas of the brain research. Yes. So interesting. And I think the LLM, large language model, is similar to brain or is far different structure. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. 
Studying the brain is interesting for two reasons. One is because it defines who we are. But the second reason that it's interesting is because brains are remarkable computer. So your brain has about 86 billion neurons and it uses about as much energy as that light bulb behind you. Very little energy. And so it inspires new approaches to computation and to machine intelligence. And in fact, the very first artificial neural networks, which were the basis for deep learning, were inspired by neurons. They fairly quickly stopped being inspired by neurons. They started optimizing for different performance metrics. But just recently, there has been a whole new wave of interest in biologically inspired design in wetware computing, which actually uses cells as a computer. So there's lots of ways in which people are very interested in the brains and their computation. This is part of that exciting research is that we haven't actually spent that much time looking at how we can optimize the energy usage. And to what Lizzie is saying, the brain is far more efficient with energy use in terms of computation. And so this is an area that is perfect at the intersection of our scientific research and our technical research. And so this is the kind of opportunity I think that lies ahead. And so I think we've only scratched, frankly, the surface. It is lightly inspired. We have many neuroscientists in Google Research. If you talk to any of them, they would say we still have much more to learn and much more to go in applying it. Is there any scientific research really impacted architecture or something at the Google research? Uh, There's things that we can't quite share right now, mm. but going forward, I expect early next year for much more to come in this space, especially uh -huh. directly. We want to, we as Google Research are really embracing the community. And so we hope to be able to share a lot of that information upcoming. Yeah. Oh, confidential. <laughs> it's still confidential right now, oh, yes. Yeah. But oh. you'll be the first to know in Korea. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> next oh, so, time. so interesting. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for participating in this interview. My pleasure. I think many Joe Korean subscribers and Korean people watching YouTube have exciting time hearing your thoughts about AI and our brain. Thank you. Thank so, you. Yeah, so Such a great. pleasure. Well, thank you. And you have a very strong following. Yeah. So I'm happy that we're able to answer your questions and be here today. Thank we you. really appreciate the opportunity to tell you about more of our work and have that shared with all of your followers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.